For real. <laughs> This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm David McDonald. I'm Sam Mercier's. And I'm Nate Blayton. And joining us this week is friend of the show, uh, Ken Ueno, uh, a uh, composer and educator who is on the show. Uh, it's been a couple of years now, and as we were just talking about before the show started, it's hard to tell what you should talk about when Ken's on because he's always got so many things going. But the big thing right now is his new opera, Gallo, which... Uh, opens the 22nd of this month. Uh, is that correct, Kim? Yes, it is. Thanks for having right. me uh, again, and good to see you guys. So, uh, just let's just start by uh, you explaining this this uh, this project. It's I've been reading a lot about it, yeah. um, and uh, f- for people that aren't familiar with the the opera project, and you've been sharing a lot about it on social media. Um, give give us kind of the, the the brief synopsis of 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 Gallo. What 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 yeah, is it? It's, it's a chamber opera uh, for two singers. Um, it's important to mention that it's uh, with Gorilla Opera, this um, um, company in Boston. They've been uh, around for about uh, seven years, and unlike most opera companies, they specialize and exclusively do new mission pieces and um, their core is uh, four instruments and uh, a singer named Aliana um, de la Guardia. Guardia. She's a soprano, a fantastic uh, actress as well and um, uh, I have a countertenor in my piece Uh, and the instrumentation is uh, um, clarinet uh, but the clarinet is playing everything except for the B flat. Uh, she yes, plays. And I, uh, I'm a, con- I, yeah, I'm, I'm a clarinet nerd, so we're going to get back to that one. Okay, so. <laughs> all right. So clarinet, uh, contrabass, uh, clarinet, bass clarinet, and a bowl and Pierce clarinet, which we'll talk about later, I guess. Alto saxophone, percussion. The percussionist playing also um, a homemade uh, metallophone. It's metal pipes in a temperament that I designed, and a cellist. So, so that's the basic of it. Uh, so the 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 opera itself is um, this. So what one thing that strikes me when you read off the the medium is that a lot there are a lot of high sounds in there, <coughs> um, and, and I'm curious about how you balance those sounds with uh, or, or how you get a balance out of all of those high sounds. You've got a soprano and a countertenor. Yes, um, and that's why I have a contrabass clarinet. Right, and a cello. So uh, uh, I was thinking about um, some of these things that you're talking about. I mean, how do you set uh, instrumentation, you know? And um, I, I definitely wanted, um, based on the libretto and a kind of feel for the text, that um, I, I wanted a, a countertenor uh, to evoke some of the kind of more Baroque aspects that I'm thinking about in the text and relates to history. And a kind of mother-like figure, so I need a soprano, um, and uh, therefore to balance with that, I also wanted a bigger spread, right, of of sound registrally. So um, that that's what the contrabass clarinet is for. Um, there's bass drum. Um, there's there's a range of sounds, and they're also playing different kinds of techniques and things as well. Cool. Yeah. Uh, so the the name Gallo, is, and you, you've described it as a, a fable. So mm-hmm. um, can you can you tell us about the the fable part of it? Uh, what what is the, the the you say there's not a narrative, right? Yes, yes. So, so there's not a, a kind of linear narrative where you know, like boy meets girl, da da da, and girl gets sick and. Uh, and dies you know, of she, the consumption. She dies of the, yeah, it's just, you know, <laughs> and there's some beautiful tunes in between. You know, uh, <clears throat> it, it doesn't have a narrative in that kind of sense, um, but it does have a kind of musical narrative which kind of relates to Baroque opera. So instead of uh, Toccatas, Rich to Chiefs, and Arias, and 
uh, interludes and stuff. I have um, a prologue. I have a pasacalia that starts the piece. Uh, I have arias, and and um, instead of rich chiefs, I have like taped music, uh, some mm-hmm. music, um, environmental sounds that I recorded at, at the beach right. in California, and uh, there's a scene in Beijing that I recorded, and uh, so uh, as kind of ostensible uh, music scenes that that become kind of um, symmetrically structured. In the piece, mm-hmm. so there's a narrative of that, and therefore it kind of relates to some of the operas that I uh, um, admired most, like especially Monteverdi, and that's why it's a fable, is a reference to uh, Orfeo. Well, and, and when I when it's, I it's kind of mythic, you know. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned Monteverdi and, and and Baroque opera and and kind of these these clear sections, which yes. is. Uh, something that I think a lot of newer opera has gone away from, where we have more of a continuous, uh, you know, sung through drama after Wagner. Um, yeah. And so that's that's an interesting shift. And and an, another thing that's interesting is you've got all of these different ideas coming in and out, and that strikes me as a a, a particularly broke thing as well, where we would an opera was in almost like like a vaudeville variety show, you know, where there was like different things going on at different times. There was ballet that would happen and, and it was, uh, you know, sometimes yeah, even participatory. Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's participation in my piece too. So really? all of us nice. relate to these kind of uh, older things too. Yeah. Because um, one of the things I'm trying to balance is um, a, a sense of uh, history, comfort, um, with with the bizarre, foreign, alien, and surprising, and ex- kind of exotic, exotic in a way. Um, an example of that is uh, I often talk about my experiences as, as a as a foodie. There's some um, which has been influential uh, in my life. Um, like for example, if the last scene in the piece is a a lullaby. I wanted something after some really weird, exotic things, you know, like uh, a middle scene in which the countertenor is wearing a chicken suit and singing in an invented language, Chickenese, <laughs> with, um, <laughs> with subtitles, sometimes false subtitles, in a landscape of Cheerios. It's kind of bizarre. How do we know if the <laughs> subtitles are false if they're in Chickenese? Oh, you could tell. Okay. <laughs> <There's> <laughs> things, some the, sometimes the Chickenese sounds like uh, Latin. You know? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's so. romantic Chickenese. Yeah, yeah. It's a Latin derivative. Uh, I wouldn't say, well, oh, romance in that yeah. sense. In, yeah. in, the, in the Roman sense. Latin sense. Right. Well, there's, there's uh, purely um, uh, asymic sounds, like, you know, and then there's other kind of fake Latin things that almost appear to be language like shit, Maximus, you know, and <laughs> so <laughs> lorem ipsum dolor, uh, and then you pick up on things that become kind of almost like me- meaning, and then you know uh, uh, the subtitle is uh, quietus, and the, the sound is shh, you know. Yeah, I really like the the using <laughs> like Hmm? The the noises that you hear have a profundity that the meaning doesn't hold up if you actually understand what they're saying. I, I like that juxtaposition. Well, it, it, there. I think there's if there's a um, semiotic range that, mm-hmm. uh, that we can play with, and that's I'm just I'm interested as a, as a reader and also as a, as a listener. Um, so there are some word games. There are so also a kind of narrative trajectory, if you will, um, of the relationship of the text and, and voice. There's an earlier scene in which the soprano sings a, a, her first song, and it's the text is really like a, a, a song lyric, and it's set one-to-one with a, a melody. And then the next aria she sings uh, is about the kind of futility of communication, and the sounds kind of become taken apart, and then most of what she's singing really virtuosic. Uh, it's a lot of it is um, sung while in unison with the saxophone, so that the sounds begin to kind of become kind of uh, 
uh, slowly decoupled from textual meaning. And, yeah. in the, and, and in the subsequent, in the last aria she sings, there's voiceover. It's actually my voice. And then she's singing vocalese. Hmm. Uh, so the sounds, uh, there's a kind of layering and then the relationship between sounds and textual meaning that is um, uh, as various levels of referentiality to each other. It seems like absurdity is a big part of this project. Uh, <laughs> well, you well know, you're talking about the, of- the virtuosity of making chicken sounds. I mean, it's, except the right. Cheerios part. That's I don't, I don't know if it's I, well. I I want it to be also entertaining. Yeah, and then, yeah. like funny, and um, and then mix it with uh, some highfalutin philosophical discussions about ontology on top of it. So I, I I hope there's different takeaways. You know, I mean, the kind of humor I'm going for is is more like Samuel Beckett and yeah. Um, you know, some of the, the writers that I'm most influenced by. I wrote the libretto myself. I was going to yeah, ask so you about that. What was that process? That. So uh, it's, uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, the secret is that I've, I've been writing words, of course, uh, but especially poetry, longer than I've been writing music, and, but I haven't had a no, uh, um, big outlet for it um, in this kind of way. So it's, it's a big risk for me. I've never done a libretto before. I've never done an opera before. I've never... I shared. I've I've written a lot of songs and um, as well. So that's you know. But a libretto is more ambitious and, and never you know in scope. So it, it was it was fun and scary at the same time as it should be. You know. And I um, been int- uh, Sam. You, you said earlier on that uh, sometimes you don't know what to talk about. I mean. I've, one of the things I've been trying to do also as an artist and I've been living, the way I've been living is trying to expand the things that I do. You know, I, I compose, I perform, and uh, lately I've been doing uh, installations, collaborating with uh, architects, and now I've written libretto, and uh, this is my first opera. And, you know, it's uh, energizing to, to feel, you know, my li- life grow. Yeah. Was, well, yeah. The, the the guys you're talking to right now are big fans of things like installation pieces. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll get back to that. We're not finished okay. ring, ring, ringing all the nerd out of talking about your your uh, opera <laughs> yet. Though. Okay. Um, the right guys, then, right? <laughs> well, you you talked about the percussion instrument you made having its own temperament. Is that temperament yes. sort of the overriding control for the pitch content, or does it come in and out of equal temperament? What's going on there? Yes, there's um, the throughout the piece. There's a different relationship to. There's a counterpoint and layering of different temperaments. So at the very beginning, there's a pasacalia, and it ref, of course refers to a broke form. So it's pretty much in in C minor, you know, and the repetition of the uh, the bass uh, felt like to me kind of like wave. And uh, I wanted um, one of the um, inspirations for the piece was my co- personal reaction to um, the Fukushima disaster. Uh, when I was a kid, my family, um, we lived uh, in Sendai near Fukushima for, mm-hmm. for three years. And uh, as I was observing these things going on, it was like this you know, um, landscape of my childhood that that's been kind of mythically wiped out, you know, and this huge level of devastation. And uh, actually made me think of um, Voltaire's reaction to the Lisbon 1755 earthquake, Mm -hmm. the philosophical discussions of which um, exchanges he had with Rousseau were more formative in in the beginnings of uh, modern thinking, you know, that uh, this... um, the, the transition that happened was that in, rather than blaming God or religion and man's sin for this great devastation, that there, there was science to explain it, the thing called plate tectonics, and the, um, that you don't have to have as many auto da fe's, you know, to try to control mm-hmm. earthquakes. Um, you know, but then um, I felt watching Fukushima unfold and you know, feeling a similar level of 
of catastrophe that that uh, relates to our sense of self, right? Whenever things big, cataclysms, traumas happen to us in the world, not just us individually, um, you, you feel a change in in identity, not just uh, you know, that something bad happened. If it's the, the scale of devastation is is, is horrific enough, um, and I. And the things, the difference I felt with um, Fukushima was that because of the the nuclear factor, that that this kind of human hubris, um, that um, with science we could control nature, you know, and nature proving itself to be again much more powerful than man could ever uh, imagine, that. Uh, Maybe there's a re-questioning of um, the the, you know, the the great unfolding of scientific thought and logic, and uh, that unfolded from Voltaire's time. That is a time to kind of re-question um, our relationship to nature, uh, because yeah, yeah the, the nu- nuclear component made it a lot worse than right. And, and that's and that's interesting that it's because you, you it's an interesting juxtaposition because you're talking about you know in 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 the 18th century these thinkers considering how people might have caused the earthquake or have some have some effect of bringing the earthquake on we now know that that's not the case but we also know that we made this particular one a lot worse yeah yeah so we yeah. didn't cause it but we did kind of multiply the effect by um, temple temple brandon has a good talk she gave that basically outlines how human hubris made the disaster a lot worse than it could have been yeah like so th- simple things like the emergency generators were in the basement where it will flood if the sea comes rushing in so that the emergency generators don't work mm. is yeah. it one example that's what the example she starts with um, and I, I just think that a lot of Americans, I have a good friend who has lived in Japan for a long, long time um, and visits there every summer. Yeah. And uh, I don't think Americans get an idea of how devastating it is and the scale because there's an island on which this terrible thing happened. And yeah. Americans with their sense of expansive landscape just can't get a handle, I think, on how scary it is that that's going on and it's on an island, a little closed system like that. Right. Where it's, and the population is much more dense. Like there are more people that are closer to it, yeah. That, and that can't go much. Like you said, the island kind of locks them in. There's kind of an inescapability of of this thing. You can't get too far away from it and still be in Japan, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, America is so big that whenever something really big happens in one part of the country, there's in a, there's a majority of the country that doesn't feel it. Right. Right. You know. Uh, Nobody in Japan didn't feel this. I think probably. I, I think it's it's much more. Uh, um, yeah, everybody, the whole country is kind of closer. Yeah. So everybody feels it, and yeah, the scale of the devastation is, is, is huge. So. And so, how how would you express that in an opera? Like those those are really huge ideas for a chamber sure. opera. So so first. Uh, um, the, the opening piece, which is Pasakali, it relates back to that again. Uh, there's a piece that uh, one of my closest friends, Wendy Richmond, she's a violist, she also sings. She had a project where she had a whole concert with pieces written for her in which she plays and sings at the same time. She asked me for uh, a piece, and then uh, it was around the time of um, shortly after Fukushima. So I was still thinking about it, and I you know, wanted to... Well, the solution I came to that piece is is kind of like my reflects my my contemplation on on that event. First, uh, thinking back to Voltaire and the Lisbon earthquake, um, you know there are these historical references whenever something happens like that. That there's a in some way that there's been a human kind of um, uh, antecedent for. Or whatever uh, big event, you know, that, and and uh, so the first half I wrote her a song. The first half is a Pasacalli in which the text reflects upon Voltaire and the Lisbon earthquake. And the second half, I just wanted something that was just 
as earnest as I can, I can do it. Kind of reflecting back to myself as a as a three year old living in Sendai, and what I did was I just wrote a, like a little song, like a rock song. Well, not really rock, like a you know three chord song, and um, <clears throat> and uh, then last year. Uh, a British um, uh, violin duo called Rhetorica asked me for a piece for their fundraiser CD for Fukushima. And then so I, I thought back to to that piece I wrote for, for Wendy. I made an arrangement of the first part and then a new version of the song at the end, uh, this time in Japanese because it was going to be for a Japanese audience. And then... Uh, on the record, on that recording, I sang both parts, and uh, so it's a kind of historical reflection upon uh, on my uh, kind of recent oeuvre as well, um, this opera. As I wanted, I wanted to. Okay, so so the main theme maybe of the opera is uh, landscape and how that becomes a kind of mirror of contemplation of ontology, if you will. And, uh, and an instigator for that personally was the Fukushima disaster. And the thinking of that, I, th- I thought it was appropriate to bring back the Pasakalia that I had written for Wendy, that I had rewritten for Rhetorica, and then it would be re- re-instigated here, you know, as a kind of recurring trauma to kind of still, still thinking about it, you know. And the, the, the Pasakalia itself as a kind of re- returning, recurring, repetitive uh, um, musical motive um, evokes evokes waves and this kind of current of history as well as being a baroque form, which is appropriate for you know, thinking about Lisbon and and um, and Voltaire as a right. starting point. So and that's in C minor, and then as we go along, uh, there's a, there's this kind of layering of different temperaments you know, on top of it. <laughs> Um, well, one of the instruments mm-hmm. involved in that, I gotta, I've got to mention this because my wife won't let me off the hook, is yeah. involved in this, is it the, what's it called, the Bolin Pierce clarinet? Yes. That is not an equally tempered instrument, and it doesn't have, I'm looking at the video of it, it doesn't have the standard number of keys, etc. So, It's actually a simpler instrument. Right. Uh, it doesn't have, it's, uh, I might think of it as um, like a modal instrument. Okay. You know, yeah, it, it's. I kind of think of it a bit as it, it, it's having its one key, if you will. You know. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, how did you learn about it? Is what I'm curious about. This because is part of the the uh, person specificness of oh. writing for this piece because um, the our our clarinetist Amy Advocat she. When I was talking to her, you know, this is, I, I'm really excited about writing for you. There's these things. Da, da, da. What instruments do you have? And uh, she says, um, well, I have the contrabass. She says, yeah, that's one of my favorite instruments, bass clarinet. I love the bass clarinet. Of course, she has the, you know, the B-flat soprano. And then she says, uh, I'm really excited about this Bolin Pierce clarinet. And uh, it's like, whoa, I knew about it. I never, you know. Um, imagined that uh, I'd be able to, you know, um, I don't know, it, it never never knew uh, um, anybody else who actually had it, you know, it's still a pretty new instrument. Um, are you guys showing a little clip of her? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. so we can, I can turn on the audio. That is really cool. Right? <laughs> I love the delicious, yeah, okay. not right, you know, not rightness of it. Where yeah. you're like, that's 
out of tune your brain tries to tell you, but it sounds so right also, you know. Maybe it's because I'm a, pl- a clarinet player and I expect it to sound just <laughs> yeah, like yeah. an equally tempered clarinet. Exactly. <clears throat> it's interesting. You can tell yeah. this is a uh, – Stephen Fox is the person who, I guess, built, invented and built this thing, and you can tell it's a labor of love. And the interesting – this is for all the microtonal nerds who want to have something to talk about. It's uh, dividing the octave using what they call the just 12th, which is a 3 to 1 frequency ratio, so dividing it into 13 steps an octave. Uh, the just 12th, I don't know if this has anything to do with it, but it's interesting that that's what they're twi- calling it, and uh, a clarinet, when it doesn't have an octave key, it has a register key that lifts the pitch a 12th when you press it. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if there's any... Like, the people who are into that stuff, I'm sure uh, they would go crazy talking about it. <laughs> right. Sounds spooky to me. Right? Yeah. I think it's beautiful, and then, um, yeah. you know... It is uh, definitely beautiful. It, it's kind of got more of a natural sound for me, kind of yeah. ancient as well as future. Uh, that's why I thought it would be um, go well in the piece, especially kind of juxtaposed with um, the cello playing uh, Baroque yeah. music. And, yeah. and as, a, as so. a parting shot with this clarinet, mm-hmm. her hands are backwards from a normal soprano clarinet, too, which it's hard to notice at first <laughs> until you go, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that is backwards. Yeah, Skype turning the video around or something. What's what's going on? Yeah, I wouldn't discount the idea that it's just played backwards normally. I mean, there's nothing that says the guy's gonna invent his own horn. There's nothing that says one hand has to be on top and the other hand has to be on bottom. Hey, no. Hey, no. <laughs> so Ken, yes, enough enough beating around the bushes. We want to hear about the Cheerios on the beach. Yes. <laughs> We've been that? talking about the landscape, but let's yeah. talk about the actual Pardon. physical landscape of your of your. Yeah, of your I, opera. I wanted the the set to be an installation, a uh, work of art in itself, and I wanted it to be a uh, kind of setting of of uh, the text in a, in some sort of way. Um, Cheerios are kind of like comfort food, so they refer to like childhood for me, mm. and uh, they. You know, if you, I imagined like a whole set full of them, they, it, it looks like a beach, you know? Yeah. And then the, the beach is the kind of uh, um, main main set, if you will, of the landscape. But is the audience yeah. going to have be close enough to tell that the small components of the beach they're looking at are actually Cheerios? Oh, yes. Um, the seating is limited. The audience will be asked to take off their shoes. <laughs> and then they're seated very close uh, to the set. And in fact, at certain points, uh, they'll be invited, um, corralled, to mm. interact with the set as well. Wow. What yeah. kind of interaction do you have in mind? Oh, well, sh- should I give it away? Oh, do you, <laughs> unless you, if you don't want to, I understand. Okay. I'm just curious, because uh, we yeah. talked about audience interaction before, and it's, it's, it seems inherently risky. Yeah. Um, to ask the audience to participate in a performance. Yeah, so it's in the in the staging, in the acting. Uh, you have to kind of coax that. You have to mm-hmm. curate curate those. You know, so because most people, you know, they don't feel like this is appropriate, or they're afraid, or you know. But uh, and then you have uh, maybe some people who are like um, you know, instigators. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. friends sitting in the audience. You know. Plants. Plans, yeah. You know, exactly. yeah, maybe. I mean, there's ways that hopefully it'll work. Well, and I think if you've gotten them to take their shoes off already, you're like that. That's a, a relatively passive thing <clears throat> that is somewhat participatory. Yeah, I, I felt like you know it's like going of, to a, a certain you know like a like a temple or mm-hmm. I, I remember going to the James Terrell show earlier this year, which was fantastic. And some of the installations, you have to take off your shoes, and then that also evokes a kind of sacred place you know yeah and and so that that's part of it bringing the audience into that and being participant and acknowledging that they're actually participants yeah well, that is because amazing to me it's the taking off the shoes and the cheerios wouldn't seem like two things that would work in tandem it's a but sacred think, and profane thing <laughs> yeah you take yeah. taking off your shoes gives it the sacred feeling and then you see cheerios and it's and I, I agree with you that it's hard to look at cheerios and not think about your childhood you know yeah 
And, and to help you along, Cheerios keeps giving you commercials that encourage you to eat Cheerios and think about your childhood. So it's a reinforced <laughs> brand all the time anyway. <laughs> exactly. Which I think yeah. works in your advantage in this oh, situation. Sure. Yeah. And, um, you know, again, as a fan of uh, Samuel Beckett, um, I remember one of the pieces that I lo love of his is Happy Days. Mm -hmm. There's these, uh, what happens is that there's this couple, a man and woman, and mainly the woman's just like talking, 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 and then it, gradually the, the sand comes up you know, over their bodies and buries them, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> so in my, uh, my opera, the, uh, one of the characters is birthed by the landscape, and the other character is consumed by the landscape. Hmm. Yeah, and I won't say exactly how it yeah. is uh, to be. No, we want to. We, we don't want to spoil it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounds mm -hmm. crunchy though. Yeah. And, and <laughs> to be clear, uh, to people who who want wow. to go see the show, tickets are on sale now. Correct. Yes. And it's a limited run. Yeah, that, we, uh, the six shows. Yeah. Yeah. That's exciting. Um, so, Starting Thursday this week. Right. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then next week, Thursday, Friday, Saturday as well. Are there any plans to, to mount it again in the future, or is this a, a one-off thing? No. We, we, there's, I feel like there's a lot more to kind of develop you know, as, I, I'm, as, I'm, as we're uh, staging and uh, working uh, on it, yeah. um, that uh, it, it would be you know, great if we had more opportunities to do it. I also end up with a bigger budget and bigger scale, and there's some things that I, I imagined that um, and wanted in terms of the staging that uh, kind of impractical at this point, you know. So um, there's definitely things um, I would like to see much more yeah. fulfilled in the future, and uh, hopefully this is a step towards that. And then documenting this, and then uh, taking the things that we're learning from it, you know, uh, can continue. Yeah, and then continue to develop it. That'll be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I think that's so. When you were on last time, we talked a lot about person-specific music, and so you're writing for this very specific group of people. You're writing for this, you know, mm -hmm. this clarinet that this one clarinetist has that not a lot of people yeah. have. And yeah. You're writing for this countertenor and this soprano, and mm -hmm. in this theater with all this really specific stuff. And I think that really lends itself to that kind of, um, you know, development over time in a way that. You know, writing in for more of an abstraction uh, of a medium doesn't, you know, because you've got all these different parts that you've created and then other people have it. But now it's more uh, collaborative over the long term. And, you know, we talked about that. We talked about your vocal concerto uh, yeah. last time you were on the show, uh, which is for yourself. And you talked about wanting to update it as, as you and your voice change and you develop over time. Uh, personally and and you know physically in your in your voice and uh, this seems like this is the sort of thing that could do the same thing for a a, a larger t kind of uh, artistic idea of uh, of of the the sets and the libretto and the and and the orchestra and the the clarinet and the singers right I, I hope so I mean um, I, I feel really blessed that uh, Guerrilla Opera fantastic performers and not only that as, as people I really admire them they have this kind of vision you know they're visionaries and they're they were really work hard to kind of help get it produce and interact with funders and all that that gets you know in the back end to actually get to the music and when they we get to the performance they're also fabulous uh, virtuosos so they're certain you know and, and instrumentalists and they're really eager and so excited and I asked for some ridiculous stuff and they're right there with me, and especially the director, uh, Sarah Myers. She's brilliant. And you know, when I talk about some things like, oh, this, uh, what about you know, Beckett? This is, should be kind of like that. She's like right there, and you're like, oh, of course, and then we can go back and forth, you know, like that. And it's just brilliant. And so I feel very lucky with this whole team. And um, uh, at, at, and I think there's more that we can keep developing so i i hope it's just not not like just just one piece but there's some things that we can continue doing together like i have with some of my longtime collaborators and you know 
and then we there are untold potential uh, for for future art that we can't even conceive of now that I, I feel is there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, to me, that's a much more profitable uh, example to set for composition students too. Certainly, if someone's got the desire to crank out an orchestral score, an orchestral score, and they have the means yeah. to do it, I wouldn't discourage them. But uh, more aesthetically profitable to me, I think, to teach, to try and encourage composition students to reach out and have personal connections in their music rather than trying to score their masterpiece for an orchestra so they can get a big name, you know? Well, what's, what is an, uh, a masterpiece, you know? You can't, exactly. You know, you get paralyzed thinking about it because yeah. the only reference we have are already achieved and you can't ever compete with Beethoven or I mean, if you're going to fight that same fight in their realm, you know, you got to do whatever it is. I mean, I, I don't, just count people wanted to do that too. It's just got to be earnest, and you got to figure out what kind of composer you are, and what, what how you hear, and what kind of artistic values you have, and then whatever it takes that you know for you to yeah. actualize it. That you know, um, yeah, you know, for for me, the kind of sounds I'm interested in, and the kinds of things I'm, I I, I want to do, requires. Uh, closer collaboration and there's some some things that not everybody can play or have the instruments to be able to play so i'm especially thankful when you know people like amy afrikat who has a bowl and pierce clarinet you know (laughs) or or mike williams the percussionist who's willing to build this metallophone for me um come into my life and and they're they they're excited to play it i feel you know even really blessed and um to have these people in my life and um, making yeah. making art with these people. So Ken, uh, you talked about wanting to expand your sort of uh, your oeuvre as an artist and yeah. your installations. And I told you we love those. So now we want to yeah. know about some of these because I've seen cool pictures of I don't know if it's you, but some people <laughs> hanging from the ceiling installing things. And if yeah. it's you, it's even way cooler too. Oh, <laughs> were you oh, the, hanging from the ceiling? The recent. Um, uh, I think you, are you referring to the recent installation in Taiwan? It looks uh, like a bunch of long bamboo slats or something woven together in the ceiling. Oh wait, 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 wait. Uh, do I have these instruments? Oh man, could I have? Oh, I don't have it with me. I can't show it to you. We got, I, have the, I have these uh, the vines that that you posted. Yeah. Oh, okay. Show uh, those. So if. That's what I'm talking about. Oh, that's and it's not horribly informative of what actually is happening or what it's going to be. Or those are little speakers hanging down. That's correct. The one, my, yeah, that's my installation. Oh, okay. okay. The one before that is is not mine. It's okay. by a Taiwanese What's architect uh, group uh, okay. who don't use blueprints. They go to a space, they get material, and then they just create this it's sculptural, and they build houses like that. They wow. ride the changes and a house happens. And then they sculptural. And then, so actually they got in trouble with the museum because it, that turned out to be bigger than uh, they had originally um, <laughs> agreed. And I, I was there when they were uh, uh, observing the installation when they had all these uh, people, like climbers on, you know, hanging from the ceiling, pulling these pulleys to install it up in that space and look really yeah. dangerous, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, your installation is the little yeah. speakers, though. Yes, there are ninety speakers. Cool. And um, I, um, it's called Breath Cloud. the The show there is called um, uh, the Cloud of Unknowing, and um, the the space they gave me is the gateway into all the different rooms. So it's the first thing, and um, as a gateway, they wanted a kind of, kind of sonic gateway. And so I thought I should make a, a kind of sonic cloud. And uh, what I imagined was um, just having lots of small articulate points mm-hmm. and uh, uh, engaging with the kind of statistical listening. So all the sounds are, are my voice. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, there are two kinds of sounds, like more like <sighs> breath-like sounds that are uh, with changes in formants, and um, and then also plosives like, hmm. right. So what I imagined 
was it's kind of orchestration with like 90 of these speakers that there's an adequate cloud like breath like sound but then as you walk around the plosives would articulate the space and counterpoint all around you and then i designed uh different kind of narratives local narratives or mm. different statistical placement of um activity so in the center for example there are centers this is a ring of five rings of speakers in the center there's six and those are the most active for example and as you go out in the outer rings it's like every other one's more active than the other but not as active as the center and then as you go out to the to the sides the speakers are um begin to be aimed at the walls so you get the reflections off the walls as well so it is um it's collaborative with the architectural space yeah as well I love the idea of a sound installation that would actually encourage the audience to move. <laughs> yeah, it's a space, and so you got to walk around and feel it. And yeah. Uh, yeah, and what I wanted was, in also in another way, a kind of oral equivalent to the phenomenological effect of observing a stream. Yeah. Um, and this is what I, I feel like many installations have to do: is that there's going to be a kind of instant, instantaneous kind of gestalt of the thing that you're doing yeah. that people have to get. You know, uh, but then there have to be different takeaways. So for people who are generous enough to stay there longer, so the longer you observe a stream, then you start kind of becoming more observant of the different eddies and how it's different all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what it does. It's you know the articulate points and the sounds, uh, the relationship of each sound to the other eighty-nine speakers is changing all the time. And that's such. It's such a wild technical feat as well. Yeah, 90 different 90. audio sources. Yeah. 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 I have a very elegant solution. <laughs> my first thing I thought was, oh, my God, I got to do it with Max MSP. And then we yeah, right. get like five computers and blah, 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 you know, and they got to get <laughs> yeah, sample, eight audio but, Yeah, right. You know, and then uh, yes. I, got, I found these little um, kind of cylindrical speakers, the ones that you see up there. Uh, they're self-contained MP3 players. Oh, nice. Yeah, so each one... I was wondering about this. Each one has a different SD card and a different... Actually, a different uh, audio file. Okay. Right? But they're, they're on a, a different loop. But the thing is, uh, they have different durations, and then the okay. plosives are paced at different points in relationship to each other. Right. It's counterpoint, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. that as it loops and changes... It, if it, it phases with each other, and there's 90 of them, so that the relationship with each other is continuously changing. Yeah, cool. Or that's ideas. That you can't tell the difference, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and the only other challenge was the keeping them powered. So each one has a little USB power thing, you know, up. And I collaborated uh, with these, um, these architects, uh, Thomas Sang and his assistant. Yeah, that's a lot of power. Yeah, <laughs> and they, they, they actually did the. Uh, I conceived of the, you know, the spacing and the circular thing and this cloud-like thing, and then uh, they did the calculations for, and they made the schema, uh, so that we, when we sent it to the museum, they were able to hire engineers to build it. Cool. Nice. Yeah, that's pretty cool, right? Yeah, yeah. Did, did you just now. pick up a ninety-port uh -huh. USB hub or something? You know? Right. Best <laughs> <laughs> part. Yeah. They had one the right half price. Right, oh, no, it's a it's an impulse buy there yeah, under yeah. the under the big red, <laughs> and to the left of the Snickers, uh, yeah. including the erasers, but not including yeah. the uh, yeah. That's pretty cool. That's <laughs> Christmas gift that somebody exactly. Uh, yeah, a stocking yeah. stuffer. What do you do with it? Oh, for the for the person who has everything. <laughs> Can you give us an idea? I'm wondering about the, the scale of the loops, the audio loops. Like, what do they range from how short to how long? Oh, uh, let's see, from about uh, 45 seconds to two minutes. Okay. So yeah. that's, that's enough to make it, I mean, you'd have to stand there for a long time to start saying, oh, I can hear patterns. <laughs> I don't think you can, because yeah. you, overall, because you start hearing, you know, the relationship of each sound to the other, it, that's always changing. Yeah. So there's also a threshold of um, kind of perception or, or scale of articulate points where it, it's, you know, it's hard to process enough of that 
permission to, I don't know. Well, in that, in that regard, you're almost asking people to not only move physically, but move cognitively from focusing on a thing to focusing on another thing to focusing on another thing, um, which I think is an interesting... Well, to feel space. Yeah. Yeah, structurally. It, but it, uh, it, I, I, you've got like the cocktail party effect of, of focusing your attention in addition to actually moving physically through the space. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's contrapuntal listening. Yeah, I yeah. like that. I like that phrase. Yeah, listening to that at, at the same time, you know, statistically as well as these sounds happening in different place, as well as trying to focus. If, if you just focused on one speaker and just stayed there for maybe like 10 minutes, you might begin to feel that, oh, there's a kind of periodicity there. Mm -hmm. yeah. But then the, the, the dynamic level of it, it the, uh, the balance... Is such that I, I think it's hard to not be distracted by the other sounds and feeling this kind of right. aggregate listening as well. Well, that's the other thing I was curious about is how you did the audio mix for this. Because mm -hmm. they each have individual volume controls on the speakers, I'm assuming, right? Yeah. And you yeah. can't remotely control that volume, or you can? No, you, you have okay. to kind of do that. So, I mean, I was there for the installation. I... I Check the sounds, and then actually, I took you know two days placing the the angle of the speaker as well as its uh, horizontal axis. You know, I'm just what I'm I'm noting that it would be a long drug could be a very long drudgerous process because every time you think we need to tweak that that get the gigantic scary ladder out and climb up there and do whatever and oh yeah well so for two days I was there you know all day. Uh, with the ladder going to each one, you know, and then, then there was one I found that was defective uh, too, oh. and and it actually took me like half a day to find it. <laughs> 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 and I pointed to the engineer. He's like, yeah, and he went up, and then like it, it wasn't working, and it was, he tested it, and it's, it was defective. And thankfully, he had it. You know, we had prepared ahead of time to have some extras. There's a there's a Clark Griswold <laughs> like joke in there somewhere. Somebody could form it and I'll tell it later. All right? Is this exactly. no? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, gosh. So, uh, so, in addition to the the opera, the on sound installations, it seems like you've been. I mean, you've obviously been busy with so many different things. Uh, I. Uh, I'm curious, like with the earlier conversation, you were talking about writing for specific performers. You've got this cello and orchestra piece. Yes. But cello with two bows, and that that seems like a really interesting thing. Yes, as well. Francis Mariucci, you know, one of the great uh, cellists of the world, I think. I'm a big fan, and we've been collaborating for about ten years now. And um, I, it's been a dream of mine to, you know, write for her uh, a cello concerto. She's developed this technique of playing with two bows. Mm -hmm. You know, one bow, and both um, bows are held in one hand, and the right hand. And uh, one is over and one is under. So she's able to play all four strings yeah. at a time. So that's, it creates a um, great harmonic uh, possibilities, therefore, as well as timbre. You know, the, the underbow is more fluty. You know, there's less pressure. Okay. It's lighter. Um, and then, um, you know... She can also do cross rhythms between them, as well as uh, you know, sulpant and tasto and, uh, against each other. Mm -hmm. The different pairs of strings. Huh. And they become, yeah, like different voices. It's, it's, uh, it's great. So that was uh, the other, the, if I have to say, the two main projects I had this year was the yeah. opera and that cello concerto, which was premiered earlier this year, also in Boston with Boston Modern Orchestra Project in, uh, in January. Yeah. I mean, I, I heard about this other vocal work, Prologue to a Thousand Years. It's, oh, yeah. Yes. How did you hear about that? <laughs> well, it hasn't been done yet. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I see it on your website, actually. Okay. So, All right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So if that's in progress. That's coming. That's, um, that's in progress. That's... Um, um, it's going to be a, a video installation, and the video artist wanted a, a choral piece, and she was going to video the, the chorus, and that'll be, um, I'm not exactly sure how it's going to be done, but um, the, the main component will be a, a, a video of the, the chorus singing this, okay. and, and then in some sort of way installed 
So it was a commission from the video artist, in fact. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Excellent. So in that piece, I got to set Hebrew. Yeah. Oh, okay. Which I hadn't done before. Uh, she, she selected the text. Yeah. It's quite challenging. It's going to be really hard to, to <laughs> set a text in a language that you don't speak. Well, I, I, um, I asked Or maybe her, you speak, I should have asked, do you speak Hebrew? <laughs> well, my name, my name, my uh, name, uh, Ken, you know, thankfully, um, means yes in Hebrew. Oh. And th- I mean, thankfully, yes rather than no. So that's <laughs> one, like, one of the words I know in Hebrew. Does that count? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, well, the, the video artist, <clears throat> excuse me. The video artist, uh, she's uh, Israeli, and so she she uh, um, made me a recording of the pronunciation, and uh, you know, then I looked at the, the the translation and it worked from there. Uh, it sounds like an interesting video project too, where the the choir is actually going to be a lot of the video content itself as well. Yeah, uh, she has a website and. No, it looks. It's, I'm hope. I think it's going to be really cool. I'm looking cool. forward to it. Uh, it's still in progress. So I can't say more. But, Sweet. Yeah. Well, we'll look forward to hopefully, that. Hopefully, we'll have then, yeah. some things and people can see it sometime soon. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, thank I think you. It so might mo- be time to go, yeah. say what. I think it might be time to address some news issues. Yeah, we don't have a lot of news this week, and that's good because we had a great time talking to Ken. Uh, yeah. Ken, do you have anything you want to plug? Before we before we wrap the show real quick, yeah, um, I guess just the opera and if people there's still some tickets available. Uh, as you said, it's an installation, so the the seating is limited. If they want to go to Gorilla Opera's uh, website, and there'll be links there to purchase tickets. And if you're in Boston or nearby, come on up. It'll it'll be entertained and and uh, there's gonna be some weird stuff. I hope. Yeah. <laughs> No, it sounds wonderful, yeah. and if you are in the area, you should absolutely check it out. We'll have links on our on our show notes, soundnotion.tv slash sn, um, but you can go to, it's it's gorillaopera.com uh, is the site of the, the opera company, and, and they'll they'll set you up, and if you, if you can't remember that, just go to our site where we have the links to all this stuff, uh, soundnotion.tv slash sn. Um, speaking of opera... David T. Little was named uh, composer in residence for Opera Philadelphia, so yeah, I'm yeah. sure there will be some interesting right. things coming from from that collaboration the over show, the next few years. Yeah, David T. Little. Yeah, and he's done some some interesting uh, theatrical vocal works already, uh, independent of this. So I I can only imagine that there are going to be some uh, equally interesting things. We talked to him about his work, Soldier Songs, um, which is kind of a a theatrical song cycle it's one kind of on that on the border between a song cycle and an opera um but very very cool stuff and so we look forward to seeing what uh david is going to be doing with opera philadelphia um and it's it's wonderful to see that opera companies are putting uh putting their money toward composer and residence programs um uh, he he'll be only the fourth one in the history of opera philadelphia so that's very cool. Congratulations to him, and congratulations to Opera Philadelphia on on you know putting some some effort behind new music and new opera, and finding a great composer to work with in in David T. Little. Um, another thing I wanted to make sure we mention is that uh, we have a we started at a tumblog this week, so we're going to be uh, when we come up with stories during the week, we're gonna. Um, Throw them on our on our Tumblr blog, and you can find that at blog.soundnotion.tv. Um, and we'll have follow-ups when things don't fit onto the show. Sometimes we have to cut things for time. We're going to cut a few things today for time, and that's fine. Uh, we're going to have a little overflow post that goes up uh, every week of things that we didn't quite fit onto the show. So definitely uh, subscribe to that uh, in your RSS reader if you are ancient enough like me to want to use an RSS reader, or <laughs> just join Tumblr and uh, click the little follow link, blog.soundnotion.tv. Uh, there's all kinds of really cool stuff. Um, we're going to be posting follow-ups on guests that we've had. So when when Ken's opera is actually premiered, hopefully we'll have some uh, some places that we can point you in the direction of some media about that uh, and maybe some coverage of that. 
Uh, we're really looking forward to, to hearing how everything turns out with mm -hmm. Ken's opera, and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to send some things your way after the fact. We, we always talk about these things that are coming up, and then we never talk to anybody after they happen. Right. So we want to make sure that we have some follow-up uh, on some of these things as well. Um, speaking of following up uh, former guests, um, Carrie Andrew, who we know from having on the show, and we've uh, covered releases by Juice Vocal, the vocal ensemble that she's one part of the three singers, she has a solo project called uh, You Are Wolf. Um, Described in one of the reviews as Avant Folk. Avant Folk, right. yes. And she had released an EP, I think a three-track EP previous, but now she has a full-length album, which is much more adventurous in, for, in terms of its engineering. Uh, Hawk to Hunting Dawn, and it's very good. Uh, lots of cool use of the voice. Ken, if you haven't heard this, you might want to check it out. It's very, right. and juice vocal too, very good singing. And, uh, a lot of extended vocal stuff. That extended vocal would, stuff. And, would and, sound you know, familiar to you, I think. Close <laughs> miking versus far miking and all kinds of, you know, really treating the voice in lots of different ways to really great effect. And the studio and, is an instrument uh, that you were talking about earlier, too. Right. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so, I mean, like, take the electronic. I was telling Dave before we came on air, take the electronic instrument noises out of Bjork, and it sounds a lot like this. <laughs> a lot of cool <laughs> stuff going on. And interesting, also, there's four remixes that are offered on a track that you can listen to and buy on Bandcamp, also called Hunting to Hawk Gone, instead of Hawk to Hunting Gone. So, mm. um, and, and when you hear the pieces on her, her album, you'll see, you'll, you can hear that there's a lot of tracking, so it's very amenable to remixing prospects. So, and the remixes are really cool, too. And one more thing I want to mention so that it doesn't get left out just because it's a good big deal is the Alan Lomax, uh, for, what was it called? Art of the Rural. Art of the Rural. Art of the Rural in uh, connection with the Association for Cultural Equity ha are announcing the Alan Lomax's American Patchwork Project. American Patchwork was a video project he did for PBS uh, between 78 and 85. This is all the video footage plus from the, the show plus over 400 hours of raw footage that was never aired. So if you want to go and see people all over rural America doing all kind, all manner of music things having to do with their culture and heritage, this is going to be a great place to find it. And I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to. I'm, there's going to have to be some creative video project or something that come out of this. Oh, tons! I would imagine. And yeah. You know, you know who's going to be all over this is our friend Ben Furman because he loves That's Alan right. Lomax and this this yeah. kind of stuff. Um, but this this to me is like the the best of uh, what the internet lets us do is have this kind of infinite archive. Um, and and as much as the internet is destroying these ancient practices, these folk practices that you know could because we all communicate with one another and so we all kind of uh assimilate and bring in these other things we we can also use it to preserve these these great practices as well um so it, it, this is kind of a combination of those two forces uh which is really interesting so we will link to all of those stories in our show notes at soundnotion.tv slash sn as well as all the things that we talked to ken about ken thank you so much for Thanks, taking guys. some time to join us yeah, this thank you. For one last thing Dave. it was great Sam, we're I, wrapping up. I promised Stephen Bryant I would mention it because I <laughs> conversed with him by email. Stephen Bryant's concerto, sax concerto, alto sax concerto, mm -hmm. written, commissioned by the Michigan State Wind Ensemble and premiered by Joe Luloff, mm -hmm. has audio and video up, and it's fantastic. Awesome. Sweet. Awesome. So that's going to do it for this week on Sound Notion. Uh, thank you to everyone who joined us live. If you'd like to join us live, you can do that on Sunday mornings, uh, 11 a.m. Eastern Time. We stream the show at sound, uh, live.soundnotion.tv. You can join us in chat and participate in the conversation there. If you're watching or listening to this after the fact and you would like to participate in the conversation, you can leave a comment on the, on the post on our site, soundnotion.tv slash sn. You can connect with us on Twitter. We're at Sound Notion as a group. I'm at Dave McDow. Sam is at Housegoy. Nate is at a Nate Tree, and Ken is at DJ underscore Modern. Uh, and you can find links to those things in our show notes as well. You can uh, like us on Facebook. You can subscribe to us on YouTube. You can now follow us on Tumblr. Yes, really, you can now follow us on Tumblr. Uh, Blog.soundnotion.tv, the Sound Notion B side. Um, and we'll be posting cool things there throughout the week. Um, so be sure to do that uh, as well. Um, 
You can, uh, as always, you can support our show by telling your friends about how much you like it. You can subscribe to the show in iTunes. You can leave us uh, a review in iTunes uh, if you like the show, and that helps other people find us on iTunes. Um, you can use our Amazon affiliate search, uh, and all of those things really help us out. Thank you so much to those of you who do that already. Um, and if you'd like to help out, those are some of the, the best ways to do it. Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Love. Thanks again so much for watching or listening this week, and we will see you back next week.